oh, this works. <laughs> Can't tell you how excited I am. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you all caught, I will be doing videos on this channel. I'll be making content specifically for it. Uh, after this is finished, if you click on the page, there's a discussion section, and you can. I've asked a general question about what problems you're having with your artwork, what things you would like to see, and I can make specific videos for them. It's not to say we won't talk about them in the live art chats, we probably will, but I might be able to make a video because if you're having an issue with something or a problem with something, other people will probably be having the same problem, and it might be a way of sort of answering it for a lot of other people. So everybody comes to uh, art from different directions, for different reasons, and we hit different plateaus at different stages, and we hit sort of walls where we just don't know how to do something, or we're having problems with it, and it creates a bit of a, a fear. I, like for example, I don't know how to make something really uh, dark, or I don't know how to shade in, so I'm going to kind of leave that aside. And people avoid the problem, which is unfortunate because learning how to get a, how to get through that problem can actually improve your work for you. You can actually then start creating the works that you really, really want to create rather than kind of avoiding the obstacles and kind of coming up with something which is good but not what really what you wanted. And I want to get you to the stage if you've been able to uh, create the artwork that you really, really want to. It's normally built. Over the next few weeks more and more people will be able to join in, find me on Facebook and then get the links that way or find me on Instagram, get the links that way and YouTube, blah, blah, blah. And hopefully we'll all come together. The drawing that I have up this morning will also highlight what else I'll be drawing today. So I have different cameras on, on screen like I've, we've had on Facebook. Uh, we've got a drawing cam which means you'll be able to see the screen a little bit better. Uh, and a materials cam so you know what I'm drawing. I put a sh screenshot of the actual thing that, that we're, we're drawing on the day. I'm going to flip over to the, one of those now. Uh, flip over to the drawing cam because over the last few weeks I've been asking people to send in portraits of themselves as selfie because I want to create a piece of artwork to kind of uh, ha bring together the experience of doing these live broadcasts but also uh, to kind of memorize this period of time in lockdown in COVID and the reason why this all happened was because the art classes were cancelled so I've asked people to send in their selfie pictures which you can send to me on Facebook because Lee Boyd Artist and you just send me a message and just send me the selfie if you've been watching this and you enjoy the content you, and I'm going to recreate uh, a, well, I'm going to create an artwork based of all everybody's portraits so I'm going to start one of those today um, also, there is a subscribe button. I know you hear this an awful lot on YouTube videos, but the easiest way to find out when this is on, if you hit the subscribe button, it will actually tell you when I'm live. And see so if you get a notification to your phone, you just hit that and it will pop up. So it should be an easier way of doing it. So if you press the subscribe button, you will actually get a link to when I broadcast something or when I upload a video. So that said, drawing cam. So. As you can see, this isn't the portrait that we're going to be drawing. This is the portrait, the animal drawing that I'm currently working on. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you uh, what I've been doing over the last week or two. Um, I've been doing live broadcasts over on a platform called Twitch. I've not really publicized it that much um, because it is literally me just drawing for hours and chatting occasionally with people who drop in. It's not as formal as this, this is more of the tutorial side of it, uh, where we can have the conversation and you can ask me direct questions about your artwork. Hopefully you're all still drawing. <laughs> Hopefully you're all still here. Um, if you are drawing anything, let me know what it is. Use the chat bar on the side. Uh, I think when the community starts working and you start chatting an awful lot, it really builds momentum. I've noticed over on Twitch, it's more of a gaming platform where people will sort of live stream their gameplay and things like that but there is an art section to it so if you're interested click on it and there is an art box so when you initially open it up it's loads of people playing different uh, computer video games which is not a bad thing um, but there's a section down below where you can click art and it'll take you to people live streaming their artwork and there's all sorts from digital art there are painters on there there are people who draw like I do um, there's people who do body, body paint, there's, there's a whole raft of different things going on 
uh, and from all around the world to so all different times of the day and night there's something being live streamed to it interesting but it's it's chaotic and it's got its own little language of the moats and stuff so um this is much more genteel for somebody like me <laughs> but i've been using twitch i've kind of been kind of enjoying it so i've been doing those as well and this is what i've been doing on twitch so i just wanted to show you where we're at with it this is a range of manable drawings it's done in graphite animal heads on people and it's slowly building up uh all the layers of graphite and it kind of shows you through all the different processes of creating an artwork that we've been talking about over the last 15 weeks anything i've mentioned during the live draw um, classes that we've been doing it's, it's what I've been doing on this so I actually do what I teach I don't kind of uh, stick to a philosophy that I don't adopt myself okay I'm gonna take this down and as you can see we have the lovely Kathy uh, one of the students in the Arts Arts Center um, comes to one of the classes and I thought it would be really interesting to start one of the portraits now. Um, I've got a couple that have come in already, so next week possibly do another one. Uh, I've got another idea for another manimal drawing that I'd like to maybe start as well. Uh, but you can let me know. Are you interested in watching this this process of portraits, or are you happy enough for me to, to, to change it around? But yeah, use the uh, chat bar on the right-hand side and let me know. So you can see Kathy. And if you sent your picture to me, um, we'll, we'll be, you will be a part of this artwork. You don't have to be if you don't want to be. It's kind of a, it's a it's an open thing. Um, but if you do want to get Leboid Artist Facebook page, I think there's a link in the uh, description below. When you uh, click the on the information later, um, you can send me a message. Just put a selfie in there, one that you're happy with, and that'll become part of the artwork. So how have you all been this week? Good. Most of the portraits that will come in will probably be, be portraiture, but you don't have to. You can take you spin your camera around and take it on a landscape view if you want. I can patchwork them in. I think patchwork faces would be lovely. We did a you know the Sky Portrait Artist of the Week, and at the end of nine weeks, everybody was posting up their patchwork of portraits that they created, and they were great. And they all kind of fitted in the lovely perfect square format of Instagram. Obviously, this is a portrait size, and we lots of portraits on involved um, but yeah I just thought it'd be kind of nice to get get everybody in there I'm just gonna kind of readjust this camera a little bit because where I'm gonna start Kathy's picture is up a little bit I'm not gonna start it right at the very edges I'm gonna come in a little bit it gives me flexibility in where I place people um, if things move around it give, also gives me if this gets framed at any stage it gives me uh, space on the side of the picture to mount it properly so I'm not kind of panicking about going off the edge or moving things around and to start off very quickly you can see I'm using a different pencil I'm using one of my propelling pencils I would normally start off using a normal um, fine pencil this is a, an H lead that I've got in a propelling pencil um, but because we're working on a smaller scale, I, I kind of know already from doing very, very small portraits, because each portrait is only going to be about 10 or 15 centimetres tall, which isn't a lot of space, because I want to fit lots of people in. Um, I could sharpen my pencil down to this point, but for efficiency, if you've got a tool that's already sharp and as hard as you need it, um, it's, it's great because you can just click it and it'll continue to be that sharp and so I'm not going to worry about sort of scale too much. I'm going to give myself a little brief box and of the same dimensions as my reference which you can see on screen. I think I've got another one queued up. I think um, Alex is next. Um, but if you say if you sent me one, sent me a picture, don't worry, it will be up there and you'll be in it. Um, it could be that I this goes on and on and on and on and I have several pages filled with people that'd be awesome um, so don't think oh well if I get down here and I've done the last one then there's no more space it could be that I just create a new sheet and there could be several panels of people it'd be nice to kind of show it at some stage I know already some of the museums have been talking about or oh, finding out from people what they've been doing during Covid um, in a way I think 
as a part of history, certainly, how COVID has affected people and what it's meant to them individually and what's happened to them, because everybody's story is going to be unique. Um, so for, for live social history, uh, I think it's good for museums and exhibition centres or places to kind of highlight that. Um, so, you know, you, at some stage there might be an exhibition of artwork that calls for artwork you did during COVID and I think this would be a great shoe-in for it. Not to say that it's going to get into any exhibitions, but, I, you know, I always kind of like have a an idea about artwork and where I could see it when I'm creating it and how people can view it and who's going to view it and what can they take from it. So all of these things have, have kind of a relevance uh, when you're building up an idea or concept for a piece of work. You can sometimes think about the end line. I've now got a cat in the studio. This isn't Inky, by the way. Inky is coming next week, and next Saturday I will show I will show Inky off. Uh, but I've got Sophie. I don't know if you can hear. She's meowing at me. She wants food. Um, I've done a, a kind of a similar style box to maybe a little bit longer to the proportions of what's on the on the reference picture. I'm not going to worry that it's not perfect right now because I just I am literally going to block in the space, marking out in that space. I'm more looking at the negative space to be honest with you right now, just initially about how far things are away. So you see where the hair comes out on the left hand side, they create a, like a, a diagonal line that way. Um, I can see whereabouts on that length that diagonal line comes to. And I think it needs to go up a little bit. And it's a bit sort of a, a spot the difference, guessing. Uh, it's your best uh, appropriation of where shapes are. And nothing is nailed down at this point. I can move things around. It's very, very flexible. I'm drawing really lightly. I'm allowing myself just to find the form of the shape. And I can do that by just general angles of things, so angles of the top of the head, or the, like we looked at there, that hair at the back, because it, it feeds into that little bit of jaw that comes down that way, and then from the jaw we have a bit of uh, shoulder and neck that comes out, and it goes back down this way for the shoulder. Uh, I get a little bit of where her, the neck of her top is. And I can see where the neck of a top is on the other side in relationship to this edge. So if you relate elements rather than to itself, because you get one thing wrong, you're trying to relate something else to it, you can also relate it to something that's constant. And the edge of the page or the corner of the page is a, is a constant. If you're relating back something that is, um, say you've put the corner of the hair here, and you I see, for example, I've put that right in line but I know that it's a slight angle so one of the things has to happen this line has to move out that way or this has to move in this way and I think this has to come out a little bit just a wee tad or maybe this comes in just a wee tad here so these two points are in so I'm moving this to the there that way and maybe moving this that way because the angle from there to there or the line Basically, the, the imaginary line going from the back of her hair to the top of her shoulder, uh, where the top of her, the neckline is on her top, is about there. It goes off at a slight angle, it's not straight down. As you draw more and start to use your eyes more, you'll find this becomes easier. You're not worrying about it so much, you're not worried about mistakes. You can draw quite lightly and quite efficiently. And I think when you look at a lot of uh, Impressionistic sketches, especially, that kind of loose approach is a kind of finely tuned uh, adaptation of this. They're not looking for specific detail, they're looking for blocks and shapes and textures and the kind of essence of the thing, but not every uh, fiber and, and stitch of a top. They'll just create the texture of it. So they kind of simplify the what they're seeing down. <laughs> Using sort of uh, the analogy, if like, you know, you hear an awful lot about people. If you half close your eyes and look at something, you get told to do that an awful lot in art class, but not exactly why you are doing it. And you kind of go, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah," 
and they go, can you just do that? Can you see this bit? And they'll explain one element of this picture. So they'll go, how close your eyes, look at the hair. Can you see the, the blackness of her hair? And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just see the blackness of her hair. And you'd never use that technique again. Basically, the reason why you are half closing your eyes is you're simplifying the information of the picture down to its core point. So when you half close your eyes and you look at your resource picture, as I'm doing now, it's not that I'm tired um, looking at the picture on the screen. Um, it gives me the, the strong, bold, bold parts of that image. So I'll get the basic shape, and I think that's all I can see. I'm not looking at detail. The detail is kind of removed from me, but I'm starting to see when I look at where this part of her neck meets her face, going across her face, it goes up at an angle and I, before I get to the other shoulder, but her other shoulder doesn't go up and follow the same line, it actually comes down. So subconsciously, we might think, oh, shoulders are straight and if they're aligned, they must go, if I put this one down, this one goes up. But we're also looking at Kathy's portrait from above and we're looking down. So she's got her shoulders level. She's not actually doing that. Pictorially it does. But she's not actually standing there taking a selfie that way. She stood quite naturally and holding it up. And because she's turned at an angle and she's looking down from this point of view, where we'd assume shoulders are always straight because they pivot with each other. And if we draw one angle this way, if we assume that the angle comes out the top, we will alter what we're actually trying to draw. Our subconscious will put things in that aren't there. This often happens when uh, we assume what things look like when we can't see them. So if you're looking at a portrait, for example, or anything in a, in a pictorial form that you're trying to draw and you can't quite see it because there's not enough information. Say, for example, it's um, several trees stood together, but you can't quite see the, the tree in the background because it's, it's in shadow. You can't really draw it in. You have to give an impression of it. So it might be just the, the simple outline shape and the shadow of it. You can't start drawing the bark on it. So you might have enjoyed drawing the bark on the tree that's closest to you because that's one you can see and that's one that's got the most light. And you'll put lots of detail, etc., on that, and then you'll get really excited and you want to put it on absolutely every tree. The thing is, you can't see it on absolutely every tree. It's the same thing when you're doing portraits. You might see something and you go, "Why, well, uh, her ear is there, but." I can't see it because there's a part of hair that goes over it and it's in shadow on her face. So I, I kind of need to map it in where it is. So I'm going to draw the ear and it can throw you completely because the ear will start to stand out because you can see an ear in a place where you shouldn't quite see it. Does that, does that make sense? So yes, shoulders. As this goes up, this one comes down. And how far it comes out is almost in line, creates this kind of triangular effect. If you go from the top of her head, where her hair is, you can kind of follow that line down and you actually get the, her, her shoulder and uh, top of her arm, a humerus, basically. And that then allows me to find the space where this neckline is. So I'm looking at um, this little bit here. I initially put a little suggestive mark of where her face was. It's not there. It's, it's Her part of her cheek is actually here. And that, it allows me to kind of start to see that where I had this initial line as a suggestive mark from the back of her hair to where the shoulder met her neck isn't her face here. That's just the hairline. Overall it suggests a line here but this is actually a little bit straighter and that does two things it'll narrow the face in a little bit because this line is also coming out of part of an angle that way and this is literally just mapping in the drawing I can give myself a, a kind of central line of where her face is, the axis of her head the axis of uh, as you can see on the screen is going off in that direction so I could put that axis in but I want to make sure that I'm not going to just put it in anywhere and I kind of then try and move everything around. I want to give it a shape, like I've done here with the overall uh, format of the portrait itself. I want to find the format of that head. 
So I want to find the shapes of it first and find that I've got it in a kind of the right location before I start going into any detail. You know, it's too too easy to kind of jump on board and jump into lots and lots of detail into a picture because we want to get stuck into the cherry of doing the, the juicy bits like the eye and things like that. Um, you will get there, but at the moment you need to know whereabouts to place the eyes and there's no point just randomly drawing an eye in the face and it's suddenly finding out it's a great looking eye but it's not in the right place and you'll be unwilling to move it. Um, but I have said many, 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 many times if it's in the wrong place, you will have to move it. And as I think I always kind of start every drawing off as a as a sketch idea. I kind of research my drawings an awful lot, um, but I always start my drawings off as a kind of um, very loose sketch approach, just to help build my confidence and allow me to know where things are, so I get reassured. Um, if I have a texture in a picture that I'm not too sure about how to do it, I'll experiment off page on another piece of paper until I find the texture and, know, and start to know how how to recreate it. That's when I can apply it to the artwork. I think often we pressurize ourselves into one rushing too, too much and trying to experiment on the page itself. So we've got that little bit of hesitancy and going, oh, I don't want to muck this up. And then if it's successful, we won't want to change it but if we've placed the information in the wrong place there's a there's a f an unwillingness to kind of go do you know what's just wrong it's not in the right place it's not in the right place for you, for you the artist it's okay to turn over the page and recreate it again because each process each stage is getting you there to the artwork that you actually want rather than um, kind of going oh it'll do it'll be all right Oh, I, I don't want to ruin it. I, 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 I just leave it where it is. I'm okay with that one. You can do that if you've kind of learnt enough from your drawing, and you're taking it on a holistic view. That it, the older these drawings are getting you to just develop your skill level, that you can turn over and start a new page, uh, start a new drawing, but take the information that you've learnt from that previous drawing into the new one. Because I see often people just well, that, that that was that picture. Everything I learned was that picture. And this is a, a brand new one. And they'll kind of repeat the same mistakes all over again. Um, I always keep my drawings, no matter if they're good or bad. Because they help me reflect on where I am with my artwork. It helps me reflect on what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. Uh, any developments in my work. Anything that's, that's successful, because you have to acknowledge those things as well. Anything that is really working in your artwork and how that's going to move on with you to the next drawing. Um, challenges that I've had, I may go off and then do further research. Um, I think the other week we were talking about different art books. We were working from the figure drawing atelier book by Juliet Aristides because we were doing one of the drawing exercises in the back of the book. Awesome book. And then we were chatting about art books. and. If I just grab it off the shelf, bear with me two seconds. Again, this is not wholly professional, <laughs> me disappearing out of camera shot. Um, certainly wouldn't happen on Sky Portrait Artist of the Week or TV. <laughs> you just see people disappearing. Um, you were chatting about art books and stuff, and somebody mentioned this one to me. It was the Lessons in Masterful Portrait Drawing, and I mentioned it, and I got it for a Father's Day gift, and it's awesome. It's lovely. Um, look, just to prove. <laughs> I'm not, so I don't make things up, by the way. This is actually true. So I got this drawing book for, and it, I started to look at how this guy was using charcoal in a in a format which is lovely and loose and expressive. And I kind of it's kind of inspired me to to experiment with some of my drawings along those lines. So. Even now, as a professional artist, with uh, a knowledge of, of art to a certain level, I don't know everything. I'll be the first person to hold my hands up. Um, I'm still keenly interested to develop my work. And I know when I go to do a charcoal drawing along those lines, it won't be as successful as that artist's work, because that's the way he works. Um, but what I do is pick out elements that work for me. And areas that I need to develop, I'll start to 
put in to practice I'll start to try them out I'll go off and do the research I'll look back at the book I'll go back to other books and pick out where I'm not quite getting there what is it I need to do that's quite difficult to do by yourself and understand that but that's why this was created so it's really important that if you are struggling with something I know I can know the kind of fear of going I'm not very good at this and I don't know how to do it because you feel very vulnerable when you ask that question whether people are going to judge you whether you're you know you're just not very good or you don't you're not very smart because you don't know everybody's in the same boat if you're asking the question there will be plenty of other people wanting to ask the same question so be brave and share the information and I'll be able to answer it for you because there's no point sitting there struggling with something when you can find out the answers to it and if I don't have the answers to it and this is what I love about being a tutor sometimes I don't have the answers to it and it makes me go off and find the answers to come back and give you the answers and share the information in but in that process your learning is my learning and that's how I develop as, as I found very important to my own art practice is through teaching I learn an awful lot because uh, I reflect on myself about what I do and how I do it and I want to kind of develop my own skills um, and, and I think in being honest with myself and how my art practice isn't refined enough in certain areas of, to where I want it to be um, it doesn't mean to say I'm bad it just means I I know that there's movement to move forward and that's exciting you know I take the challenge and see it as a uh, an, an interesting uh, development of my work rather than me going oh I'm an amazing artist and you should buy all my artwork you can buy my artwork if you want to but I actually do my artwork for myself first and foremost um, I don't try and chase sales it's not about sales so much it's to make a living yes you do need to sell artwork and sell prints and do commissions and things um, but it's not always about that itself it can be just the expression of art is what feeds you as an artist and developing your artwork takes time there's no rush um, there's no rush to the profession being the professional level it, it, that not happen naturally if that's the direction you want to go into because as you take yourself and your artwork seriously and it, it doesn't matter if it's just a hobby it's it's serious because you love it and I've seen plenty of people who are passionate about golf and take it very seriously and they are not pro golfers right so as an artist it's the same thing you can take your interest seriously and enjoy it um, so uh, uh, anything though you want to learn I mean first of all joining this is great you know and I thank you for being here and that's not being sycophantic and just going hi guys thanks for being here. I actually mean I really really do thank people for joining on otherwise you see over the last 15 weeks it would have been really tough because I really missed the classes so um, that's why I've kind of opened it out onto different formats it might feel very weird moving from Facebook to YouTube because you kind of get cozy in one social media platform it's very hard to move across the other one but there are flexibilities within YouTube that is a little bit more difficult with uh, Facebook and as hopefully as this goes on we can throw in more stuff that'd be great um, as well also saying about the subscribe bar hitting that just means you're gonna get notified if you don't want loads of notifications and you just know it's at 11 o'clock on a Friday you don't have to press it if you don't want to um, but if you want uh, information when I'm putting up other content it will let you know when that goes up as well it's like I said in the video of um, me sharpening a pencil which sounds completely dull and boring and <laughs> but I've seen I've seen a couple of them um, done out there so YouTube's a marvelous place for, for information like that because once you find one video on the one subject there's like you find there's lots and lots of other video videos on it and some give you different parts of information at the minute I am going to be putting in a shower and I have learnt how to put in a shower 
uh, purely from YouTube. I didn't just watch one video on how to put in a shower. I watched uh, a lot <laughs> and all the different bits and pieces and stuff. Um, so I'll be getting on with that soon. Uh, <laughs> that will be my haven from tiling <laughs> and bits and pieces. Uh, so yeah, I never didn't just use watch one video. I watched like I've been watching loads of them. Um, and some of them are really good on one key point. Like I might be able to show you the best way and how to sort of hold a blade and things like that, and then be other ones that do it slightly better. Feed back the information because if I learn from that, I'll be able to um, put it put more work into my artwork as well and more videos and stuff. So yeah, share the information around. So I'm just looking at the form. Now at the minute her face looks incredibly round here. Too much so. And I think as it comes down this point, I've got it kind of going off in that direction too much. It's a little bit wider than that and it comes down here and then out that way. So this part of her face has moved slightly. It is in line more with this, so it starts there. It comes down that section. That's where the corner of a neckline is. And it's probably not as round as that. Um, the erasers that I've got, again, just this tumbler eraser, because I'm drawing lightly, I can sculpt. Uh, and get rid of any lines that I don't want anymore. So some of the bigger lines that I had initially, like the big line that went through there, or the big line that came down here, I can get rid of. So, what I know initially when, you, when people start off, there becomes a fear going, oh, this looks too round, it looks too big, I'm worried about this, that's not right. This is literally just finding the shapes of things at the moment. Um, I can do certain things like, the, rather than draw details of the glasses, what I can do is put the angle of the glasses on. What I'm trying to find a little bit difficult is because my I normally have it here and I draw side by side and I've got, because I'm kind of talking to the camera, I've got a picture on the screen uh, that you can see on your screen and I'm kind of moving my head backwards and forwards. I would also suggest having it right in front of you. So the only thing that's moving is your eyes because you can adjust it quicker. So I'm just looking at how, yeah, I was talking about angles of uh, her glasses. So I can see from this little anchor point that we had at the back of the hairline here, you know, this bit that came out and goes up that way, it creates like a, a point here. It does give me a bit of an idea about how that kind of comes down at an angle like that. So. I'm going to put a very loose light line in, in a minute. As I said, because I'm drawing off to the side and going back to my page, I'm going to try and get it up on my pictures. The information I want so far is is pretty much there. And already I can kind of see this is much straighter. Um, I can bring this angle out a little bit closer. So something as simple as positioning your your reference can really help your artwork because you're not trying to bounce from one to the other. Now notice this little bit of hair follows actually the shape of the forehead going around this way and it tucks back in there to a point and then comes back out. But I think this point needs to be lower down. Which means I can get rid of that line. I'm looking at the overall shape and I think where this comes out there I can also add lines in, because we've got a, a kind of an approximation of that angle. I can give little suggestions of the size of the glasses, but it just helps me find the shape. So I'm looking at, say, um, I don't know if you can see that on the screen. 
Let's see if we can pop that around a little bit and flick you back to the other camera. One to one camera. Yeah. So I think you can see that on the screen there. Um, I'm looking at this part of her glasses and that part of her head, the hairline going up. So that part of the hairline going up and that side of her glasses coming down. Can you see how they make that kind of a triangle without a base, basically? Uh, and that's the shape I'm going to concentrate on as I'm drawing. I'm not going to try and draw glasses. I'm not trying to draw a hairline. I'm literally going to try and put those two shapes in that they kind of make a, a similar triangle. Once I get that negative space in, it becomes a good anchor point to kind of then measure things else from it, so I can get spaces right. So yeah, I've got that kind of shape now happening. I'm not going to draw this line all the way down, obviously her glasses aren't that far, but what I can do is give an indication where the bottom of her glasses comes. Now, when I look across to a hairline, this angle of her hair coming down comes down to about, I'd say about there, and then there's another little section of hair just underneath it, like that. But this, these glasses actually line up on an angle with that part of the hair as they come down, and it might seem like, oh, this is all the angles. I'm, don't think of them like degrees, like you're using a protractor. Just think, if that's there and that goes off in that direction, it goes along this way. And one of the simple uh, ways of doing this, if you've got it, I normally suggest people print things off. Um, you can actually use your pencil to put it on your reference, like that. And then you can just move it, because you're not adjusting the angle, over to your drawing, like that, and draw a line for the angle from your drawing. So you're not actually moving it. Take a little bit of practice not to kind of like move it like that as you're doing it. Keep the angle. Oops, just lost it. Bring it back. Yeah, but keep the angle. Move it across to our drawing. And put it in there. And that gives me the angle of the bottom of the glasses. And what that should line up with is that part there. And, believe it or not, it does. So I don't know where the bottom of the glasses are. This isn't a feature. I'm just going to do that so it, I can build in some of these other shapes. I'm looking at uh, now, as this face curves around to the part of her cheek, here, the bottom of her chin, obviously gone off in this direction, centre of her face, is about there. I say about because I might move it a little bit, might adjust. But there's a line here for this side of the face, which comes up. And it comes up about halfway, so this is the centre point of her chin, and this is the point here where it goes up that way. Halfway is this kind of shape here, and it's uh, from, it goes from... It goes from the base to the corner of the mouth. And again, that creates almost like a little triangle shape. It doesn't go up straight, it goes off at an angle, so I take, like we use for the base of the glasses, and transferring that a lot across. I can use the vertical line that goes off that way, it's not vertical, it's straight down, it's slightly angled. Slightly leaned over. I can move that across. And it kind of goes off that direction. So that's one way of, of laying down lines. But you can also um, use a plumb line. So you could use a piece of string that went right down the centre of your picture, and it'll help you know that if I do a line down the centre of my drawing, everything should be put to one side of it, and everything should be to another side of it. And it just helps you break it down. Gridding is also another way. Um, I don't tend to use gridding too much because I think sometimes, especially starting off, gridding takes over the drawing. People are, are, are kind of rule out a grid very, very quickly, and if they're slightly inaccurate with the drawing out of the grid, it will throw the drawing off because where each square is slightly different sized, and you may have a different grid drawn over your reference picture, the two grids don't match up, and you'll kind of force them to match up for your picture, and then when you start removing all the, the, the lines of the grid, you'll go, that's not the same, but I measured, and then you'll blame yourself, but it's actually the grid space. So if I'm going to do the grid, what I would say is, see if you can uh, draw a grid out on a computer so it's very uniform, and instead of printing it out on paper, get it printed out on a clear, transparent page, and use that to overlay your drawing and your reference, so you get two of them done, because you can move the drawing out of the way, you're not having to redraw over your page, it also means you're not going to have to then rub it out. Often people, again, it's an issue, we're just starting out doing it, and you will learn very quickly. But if you draw a grid out on your drawing, and you draw it too heavy, as you go to rub it out, you've got like a ghostly image of a grid, and I see an awful lot in artworks where the grid is still there, and I don't want to look at grid, I want to look at your artwork. And I can, you're almost like showing me your process, and not your artwork. Showing your process sometimes can be interesting if it's a, it's a conceptual thing that you really want to show and showcase, but if it's something to get you to the stage of knowing where everything is, and it's still there in the drawing at the end, it can look a bit odd. So that's why some of these people have a grid. Gridding isn't bad. It's just that um, all I'm doing basically is using A1 grid square, and using the same process as you draw each grid, I'm using it to draw the entire lot, A1 picture. I'm using that site size kind of issue where I have a picture here, or my picture there, and I'm using my eyes to look at and refine each individual uh, element of the drawing. I'm going to bring this cheek in a little bit, because I just looked at that, because I just noticed how it lined up with the edge of her hair, here. So as I do this, I can start to refine some of these edges. And already it starts to you know, narrow features in, and, and starts to have more representational shape of what we're drawing. Um, I can map in things that are not actually on the face, but are still important. So getting portions of her shoulders correct is interesting, because if you get them too sort of shallow, um, or too rounded, or you know, not looking like the part of the body, can throw off a beautiful portrait. It doesn't matter how much work you've done on the face. If the proportion of the shoulders are really, really narrow, it will always make the head look too big. Or if the shoulders are, the shoulders are too wide, it will make the head look too small. So they have to be in balance. Even the suggested marks of things need to kind of be in proportion with the thing that you're, you're drawing. And people get a bit kind of scared of the word proportion a little bit because of um, their idea of having to know exactly where everything is. I'm not talking about proportions of the face. I'm talking about proportions of your reference. So where's the top, where's the bottom, where's the sides? Uh, what is in the middle of that page? The proportions that way. Or scale, if you like. I think the camera's just clicked off because I just heard it. <laughs> I'm actually drawing this triangular type shape here just looking at how 
that neckline. Can you see how that neckline works? Don't know if you can see that on there. If I zoom that in a little bit, maybe. Does that help? Hope so. This is kind of in more interactive. Um, if there are things that I'm doing on screen which are frustrating and you, you you need kind of more clarity on things, do let me know. I'm not a I'm not an oracle. If I say if I could read your mind, I would. Uh, and I knew what was coming in the future. I would have lottery numbers. <laughs> I've just looked at that. Little, there's a little highlight. I don't know if you see it on the face, just underneath the cheek. A little tiny triangular highlight, just in this area. But it's great because it's right in the centre of the glasses, and it's just off to the left-hand side of the nostril. So it lets me know where the top of the nostril is. And this is how I, I will allow the picture and the mark making to start to inform me where things are. So when we were mentioning proportions earlier on, it's proportions of the of the picture that you're drawing, not general proportions of a face. General proportions of a face work in kind of exercises if you're drawing somebody straight on, generic face or profile that way. Uh, but a human face, rather than a generic one or a stylized one, has so much individual differences to it, just small differences. And that's what really makes portraiture interesting. Now, why are our faces? all completely different. Um, there's subtleties in skin texture and tone, how it reflects light. Um, you know, if you've got particularly oily skin, it'll create a, lo a lovely uh, sheen. Um, if you've got very dry skin, it's more absorbent and more matte, it'll take shadows differently. All of those little kind of nuances can really build character, but are about the individual. So they won't be the same. You can use some similar uh, approaches, which is basically what we're doing here. We're breaking the drawing down. But if you stick to the ideal form of proportions, you will make everybody's eyes perfectly in the middle of their head, you know, between there and there. In general, that's right. But occasionally, somebody's eye might be slightly different. So the angle, slight differences in angles can throw off your assumption of uh, proportions if I could say it sounded like I had a uh, speech impediment about getting the word P out uh, maybe a time for a sip of coffee <laughs> Cut these sessions on Saturday mornings have been brilliant I oh, appreciate that thank you Cut, I've been enjoying them as well they're uh, they're a, a little guide in my week to let me know I'm doing something um to kind of get me organized to do other stuff around it and it's kind of then spills out into me wanting to do more stuff as well i've done loads of artwork over covid because i think personally these drawing sessions have helped me kind of get inspired to do more it's encouraged me to go off and do more stuff um in the live classes that we have in the arts art center here in northern ireland a town called newton arts we have a, an art center that i teach classes at for those of you who've got no idea what i was uh what the Arts Art Centre is. Um, when I'm in the class, I don't draw that much because I want to see you draw and I go around your drawings and I help you find the solutions to your, your drawings. Um, so it's been a real pleasure for me to actually get on with drawing and teaching at the same time. I just realised when I'm doing demos in the class, everybody stops drawing and therefore it, it kind of defeats the purpose. I want you to draw. I will do demos occasionally in class, but... Um, your experience for your learning and your drawing means I can help you with that, if that makes sense. So likewise, I'm asking people to send in pictures. If you're having problems with a drawing or you just want some feedback, um, you can send me a picture of that on Messenger on, um, on Facebook as well. And I can give you some feedback on that. I had a chat with Ben last week and I've had a chat with Kathy before about this. So it's it's really good to root, root into kind of being very one-to-one uh, -one tutorialship with our work. I'll try and do that with everybody who who wants that kind of feedback. I've also got oh yeah yeah I've got some good news about um, 
Again, there's no specific dates for the live drawing class uh, at the Arts Art Centre yet, but there's conversations going on about how they can do that. Uh, so hopefully soon, information will start to flow about when and where they're going to do it and how they're going to do it. Obviously, there might be some restrictions in place. Again, I don't know what those are yet, um, but it's good to know that some of normality is, is happening and we're getting back to um, the idea of, of having our drawing classes back. But it's not to say that these will stop, they won't. They might change time because I normally teach from 10 to 12 because <laughs> I can't do this at, at 11 o'clock. So I might change the time on a Saturday. So I might go from a, a live drawing class in the Art Centre that I would do from 10 to 12 and come back here and start this at 1 o'clock. Um, So, I, I think, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to continue these because I, I say I think it's benefited people who are not necessarily in Northern Ireland where we live. Um, and reaching out to people is, is a really good keen way to find out how artwork is being viewed from different countries as well and for different reasons. Uh, and for different practices and different uh, takes on what art practice means to different people. All of that is really interesting to me as an artist and I'm always constantly trying to uh, learn how people see things because that helps me as an artist when I'm trying to communicate things, how that actually works as well. You know, how does uh, a drawing that I might culturally think work, works for one nation. How does it actually work in other nations? You know, is there a different con uh, concept or, or construct to an idea about something? So, for example, the animal drawings that I'm doing. Um, if I use an animal in a certain way, because my perception of how that animal is seen and then how it's viewed from a different culture, from a different part of the planet, I might see it completely differently. I think that's always interesting to kind of feed in to your artwork as well. Um, there's also commonality uh, where you wouldn't think and how reaching your artwork can go. So as you get brave and you start showing your artwork online and you start talking to more, more people, there is a uh, connectedness where you start to realize there are people who are learning at a similar rate to you, have a similar experience to you. You can share your knowledge with them. Learning from your peers is, is one of the most vital things, I think. Um, to anybody's progress in a subject because everybody's in the same boat and everybody learns at a different, different rate we've mentioned before and but it's been one of the key things behind my art education is learning from other artists um, I say I specialized in fine craft design and I specialized in ceramics we did we were encouraged to draw an awful lot in the making of something but I wasn't formally taught how to draw things in a formal setting of well, we went to found an art foundation and did my art a level and o level back in the day um so we were taught how to do certain tasks some of the very very basics of art but the refinement and development of art when it came to the art college was much more about the development of drawing for a thing which was the ceramic side of it and so i don't think Formal art training will take you so far, but your continuation with your artwork can be from learning from your peers, from learning from doing from it, and that should work in hand, hand in hand with education, And because it's one of the things you go to after education stops. When you come out of university, there is no tutor behind you to guide you. You have to be more self-reliant. So if you've developed those skills, and communicating and sharing artwork it becomes a lot easier. Uh, how do you do a portrait when you do not really like the subject matter? I was asked to do a, a chinchilla. Jahau? How do you say that? I'm slightly dyslexic, so when I see words I, I don't normally say, or I find no how to pronounce. I have to say that uh, they are not my favourite dog, and I really struggle. Again, sometimes you do get asked to do. Um, commissioned to do works and 
it may not be your thing, but I always try and find the root of interest in it. I always try and bend the commission round to just something I can find interest that I can invest in. So rather than liking or not liking a breed of dog, you can break it down into you might like drawing the texture of fur, how the texture of fur works, because how that texture of fur works on, uh, I'm going to call it a chinchilla. For better, I've got that. Ch how, how, how? <laughs> if you're laughing your socks off my terrible pronunciation of a word I can't read properly, um, I'm glad I'm making you laugh, because it makes me laugh as well. But I think it's a chinchilla. Chinchilla. Ch how, how? How, how are we? How, how? My phone was Hawaii we, um, phone ages ago. Got a different one there. When I first got it, people say, "What phone have you got?" And I couldn't I couldn't tell them. I just had to, hold, had to show it show it to them. Uh, and that's that's my issues, not anybody else's. Um, so yeah, if it's a, if it's an animal or a shape or a, a, sorry, not a shape, a a subject matter which you're not comfortable with, or you like, say for example, I didn't like cats. I do, but say I didn't like cats. I wouldn't go, oh god, not a cat again. I'd go, okay, what what context is this kind? Uh, what shapes am I looking at? What textures am I, look, am I looking at? Because they're all different. You put you put the same person in a different lighting situation, they look different. You put them um, in different clothes and different postures, they can appear, their, their appearance is different. So you can control that element of it. Um, if it's done, normally somebody says, I've got a picture of an animal, uh, of my dog, can you do a drawing of it? And you go, yeah, I can do a drawing of it, but how good is it? How good is the picture? Sometimes I find it's not necessarily about the thing that I don't like, it's the quality of information I've got is not enough. You know, because they want a very um, life-like representational image of their dog, and what the hand me is a blurry photograph in the 1970s of a dog that I had when they were five. And it's taken uh, when it was a dark day, and it's a black dog, and it's lying on a uh, brown blanket, and it's just a smudge. And you kind of go in. I've got no idea what your dog looks like from that picture. Um, I can do a replication of the imagery that you've given me, but I don't know what your dog looked like. You can, you can kind of guess what. If, say, for example, it was a specific breed like, I'm going to say Labrador, a lot easier. <laughs> if it's, say, for example, a breed like Labrador. But then you go around and have a look at lots of Labrador faces, and they're all slightly different. And they will only remember their dog's face. And if you get it wrong, they're going to be upset. So sometimes it's kind of balancing those kind of things. But that's all communication. Um, I have in the past, if there's something that I just wasn't, it wasn't was my cup of tea and I wasn't comfortable doing it. I normally pass it on to another artist. You know, I know plenty of artists out there who do good, really good uh, animal portraiture. Not to say I don't do animal portraiture, but I might be swamped with other stuff and I just don't have time to do it. Or um, the sometimes the price point that they want to purchase the artwork for isn't worth my time. And that doesn't. And that's not necessarily arrogantly, but as you build up your art practice your the value in your work develops and what you can't do is chop and change your price structure just to suit you know what people want to spend in artwork because otherwise people will spend a quid and are you going to spend a week <laughs> creating an artwork for a pound and because if you're a business you can't you can't afford to do that so i but there are maybe people out there starting off and go well I just want the experience and I want to get a little bit of money for it and they're quite happy. It, it helps them develop their their um, confidence in going through the commission process because they've never had one before and then for that experience they then feel that they can then say yes I've done commission work before and this is the following. So if you're not ever happy with doing something and you don't want to do it, don't do it. Pass it on to somebody else. You can be polite. You know. Uh, I think if I always, I always say to people, look, Chihuahua, try that. Yeah, is that how it's spelt though? You see, to me, we I always have this conversation with Andrea that I spell things like the same, and she thinks I'm quite punk in my spelling. <laughs> I just and she, it's it's not correct, but it is right because of how you spelt it. Chihuahua. I thought it was a Chihuahua, but just I didn't realise it was spelt Chihuahua. I'm sure that's got. Uh, in I think it's Spanish 
I'm sure there's a translation into what that actually means. Was it Portuguese? I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm using too much. Not enough drawing. I'm just putting in a couple of extended lines there. I was noticing how the line from the nose and this line the curve of her cheek here kind of line up in one line, but there is there are slightly kinked. It kind of slightly bends out. So rather than a curve, I'm going to put two angles in. I'll bring this one down to that point, and then that one out there. It's just a guide at this point. Um, Again, that's not the best resolution for that, possibly due to the light. It's got a bit cloudy this morning. Um, I'm also going to look at the, this kind of triangular shape. The actual overall shape of her nose is quite triangular in this picture. Not to say that Kathy has a triangular nose. I'm just going to look at the basic overall shape. And the angle of it as well. The angle of what they call this is part of the uh, underneath the nose to the top of the lip is called the philtrum. Um, so the base of the nose follows the line of the angle of the mouth. Um, and the point of the chin is here. So we start to get this kind of line appearing that comes up through the head. It's not a million miles off the one we initially put in, but it's slightly to the right of it. So I'm going to just refine those marks. Maybe lighten that one because it's a little bit heavy. But you can start to see how the forms, the shapes of the things start to build up what it actually looks like. Lee, thanks. My son is dyslexic as well. And yeah, it's spelled that way. <laughs> Uh, I've, I haven't been for I think I'm borderline, um, but I've realised with it has made me very creative thinking wise. Because when it came down to writing things, rather than avoid writing, I had to think of another word that I knew. So my vocabulary grew, and how I used language grew. Um, I I didn't do particular. Well, I did all right. I got my got my O levels uh, with English, but what I found was because of the way I write or inform is very much how I talk. So I talk in a stream or a constant and my sentences are like paragraphs, right? And Andrew was saying to me, she goes, because she's got two degrees in English, right? She's got a BA and she's got a master's in English. Um, and she goes, she never put punctuation in. And I always say, look, when it comes to punctuation, I shouldn't be dictating to people when they take a pause to take a breath. They can do that themselves. She goes, yeah, but the content of what you're saying doesn't get across because you want to, them to intellectually pause. So I'm I'm trying. I just I feel almost rebellious against the point of putting in punctuation. That's got nothing to do with dyslexia. I put a full stop at the end and a capital at the beginning. And the rest, I think, you, you, as you invest in somebody's, the way they style the, the, they talk, Oh, they think that will come out in the in the text. That's just my take on it. I'm realizing because of communication on the internet and stuff, occasionally you have to put in commas and semicolons and stuff like that. Um, wasn't so great when you were doing it for GCSE in the, or O level or A level. You kind of have to follow the rules. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of picking things up as I go along. Um, still with that, with it with the written word, uh, but it's. It's got easier in lots of ways because, again, being a more uh, creative in the way you think and the way you have to get around the solution or the, the issue or the problem, you start to find an alternative route to it. Art is very much like that. If you draw something, how are you going to do it? What, what's the best way? What, what problem is It's constant problem solving. Um, and so, like, I'm it's a visual puzzle that you're in control of that you've got the answers to but you just don't know yet that type of way of looking at it um, so as we was, as I was pontificating <laughs> again look how verbose am I um, as that as I was chatting 
I'm just building in that shape. I'm not looking at glasses. I'm not drawing glasses. I'm drawing the shape first because as the drawing develops, I can refine the shapes and textures of things to make them look like a pair of glasses. Um, when we were doing Sky Portrait Artists of the, of, of the Week, people started moaning, <laughs> going, Oh no, not another beard. Oh no, not another pair of glasses. And, uh, oh no, not hair. <laughs> <It's> going, <laughs> at some stage, going, Oh no, not a head. <laughs> you know, portraiture is made up of all different types of stuff. I don't wear glasses all the time, sometimes I take them off. Um, but you've got to be adaptable. You can't have. You can, I suppose you can if it's your artistic vision to have everything one way, which is fine if that's what you want to express creatively. But I think as you're developing as an artist, expose yourself to lots of different elements that you can draw from that will push you, push you to the point of not knowing how to do it. As artists, professional artists, constantly trying to push ourselves to find where the limits are of our experience or our technical expertise because we'll push them to the point of breaking when they do we can kind of review it and go okay how did that not work what went wrong how can I improve that what else can I do and we use that as a jumping off point to develop the work even further so that's how we kind of progress we don't just don't you just don't there's no sort of um, A B C D F grade grading system with artists uh, where as soon as you hit A, that's it. That doesn't exist. We're all trying. We're all doing exactly the same thing that you're doing right now, picking up information, trying it out, failing at it, trying again, failing at it, trying again, improving on it, knowing that you've learnt something, not knowing what that is, trying it again, got a little bit better. We're we're all we're all doing that. We're all in this, exactly the same boat. So. I don't think there's any hierarchy in artists. I just see the ones that are inspiring to me in what they do. And sometimes it can be, I don't necessarily like the artwork that they do, but I really appreciate the technical skill. And sometimes I can really love a piece of artwork, but not necessarily like the technique and the way it's done. I like the conceptual idea or the the feeling that it evokes, and I can cherry pick out of different artists different elements of their art artistry that are relevant to me and and how I would then like to be as an artist myself. And through practice, that's when you start to develop your own little voice. I think if you start getting stuck su sucked into doing uh, styles too soon. Let's say you can't experiment and play with them. Do do that. But I mean, if you uh, say, no, this is the only way I do it, and you've only been drawing for a couple of years, I think you may find yourself at a cul-de-sac very soon where you kind of get a bit bored with it and you don't know what to do next. Uh, and it can be very, very frustrating, you know, we hit that kind of like, oh, I don't know what to do, and uh, I haven't drawn for ages, but I want to draw, a, because I draw like this, I. Uh, and I don't want to draw like that anymore. I can't change it. You know, people trap themselves into that belief. I'll try and stay open, flexible. I mean, I've got manual drawings, portrait drawings, portrait paintings. I've got. Uh, if I need to scan up there, I scan out a second and scroll up. You'll see a large painting on the wall. That's for an exhibition that I want to do in the future. It's one of about 27 portraits. Um, that's one of the mammalian ones. There's one hiding behind the PC. If I can spin it around, there's another one just hiding behind there. That's half done. Um, I've got another one on the easel. There's lots of different elements to my art practice because occasionally you do get frustrated with things, or they take you to a um, a kind of pausing point where you kind of played with it enough where well, you need to break away from it, but rather than doing nothing, I have other things to go to. So, get back on with this drawing. So I get a good kind of approximation of where things are starting to happen. I'm starting to feel better about certain shapes and things. Um, I can get, there is a 
a muscle or a tendon from the neck that comes down this way, Kathy, and I can see that her neck is there. About there. And that comes up there. And around that way. Comes in a little bit. Okay, just refine that edge. Take that out. So at this stage, I'm just kind of cleaning up some of the marks I've got in in the drawing because I don't want to overly confuse my eyes as I start to kind of plot some of the shadow shapes in. That I want to. It is quite blocky and chunky at this point, um, but that's okay. Uh, it's it's not about having the refined finished portrait at this stage. It is literally just finding the space of where things are. But it can look a bit angular, and the things that will soften it is then looking at shadow shapes within the spaces. Again, it'll still have a certain uh, blockiness to it, but when you're building a shadow shape, for example, if you look at this one underneath the mouth, uh, there's a space just underneath the bottom lip that comes up here and then down this way as a shape of the shadow that creates the shadow and shape of her chin that way and it's got a similar tone to it apart from the highlight in the middle and you can go in you can shadow or lightly lightly uh, shade just very flatly that shadow shape and as you start to build up the forms of all those shadow shapes I start to see one that comes out here it's a little tiny, almost like a dimple. But well, it is a dimple. Almost like it is a dimple. I can put it in scale. The, remember the little white highlight area? I'm going to leave that. There's a section to it next to it there. And then this side goes up through the eye. To the corner of the eye, it's halfway kind of through the glasses there. Comes up that way, creates a little highlight, a little slither of a highlight just about there. But this is all in tone, so I can then shade all this back in. Again, I'm doing the shading lightly, I'm not trying to get perfect tone. And there's kind of comes down that way, not that way, but that is darker than this. So, it gives you a blocky um, sculptural effect of, of making you kind of a s simplify down what goes from light to dark by blocking in the shadow shapes. You know, shadow, the shadow shapes within the eye orbits as well, where light is catching glasses and things. Um, there's a window that's being reflected in her glasses, and I kind of want to keep it in because it doesn't uh, doesn't obscure her eyeballs, but it adds a nice uh, element to it pictorially. Kind of covers this one a little bit, just on the bottom, but it's on the same line as that one, so I'm bring that one across. And then there's a, a line here. Let me find the bottom of those glasses. Again, I'm going to use to draw this triangle shape rather than drawing the bottom of the glasses. So I want to get that shape of the triangle right. And that is a little bit of a shadow line there. So this is literally lightly shadow, shadow, shade, shaded in. Shaded in. Uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> Sometimes when you build a shadow up to the next shadow, you realise that this one's darker, and you can go back in and just darken it again. And that's how you build up 
the, to the tonality and the change of form is that you go over one area, a certain darkness, and then you have to go over another. As you build up the layers, you can start to really sculpt shapes and stuff. Um, this bottom lip is a lot darker, so I'm going to darken that down. Again, I'm not necessarily pressing hard, I'm just putting light layers down. It looks darker. Because it's on a white page. And take the fear and the worry out of it. If you just go, this is a triangle, I want to make sure I get the triangle shape right though. That's the thing, you want to get make sure you get that shape right. Because if it's not, it'll throw you out a little bit. So spending your time just a little bit extra time planning making sure that your uh, forms and lines are, are, are right rather than rushing a drawing if you plan that out well first it will solve an awful lot of problems for you later on it can seem dull but if you actually make that an enjoyable part of your process you'll, you'll find that your drawings start to improve a lot quicker because you're not worried about them so much because you of the fear of oh I know this is going to be hard later on when I go to, sh to do all the shadows because I've kind of rushed mapping things out because you wanted to get to the end of it it's almost like a a speed thing uh, it's the biggest key issue I think most art people starting out in art have is they think they've got to do it quickly to get through it um, it's pretty good likeness. Uh, I'm pleased with it. Great, cat. Great. I just realised your cat, Kathy. <laughs> I think am I? <laughs> it's because you've got a different logo and you're called Cat on YouTube. Um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, who said teachers are clever? Nobody. <laughs> I'm literally just sat here having a laugh and enjoying myself um, and it, uh, not that I'm, I'm making fun of art but this is really enjoyable it's kind of it's fun and I think there's an element of of learning we've kind of seen as a chore and I don't know where it came from because it's not really a chore if you have a, a love of what you want to do um, you know if you've got a reason to learn it should be an inspiring thing but I don't know where is it possibly from school that we still got the hang up with learning um, but it's such a beneficial thing f for to help you in lots of different ways not necessarily just to do tasks at work or to make money from it it can literally be something that can be beneficial to your mental health it can be beneficial to your happiness lots of different things sorry I do confuse people yeah not as much as me <laughs> I really confuse people <laughs> you're pleased with it that's the main thing though you're starting to see elements of it now elements of it might look uh, Larger, larger and wider and things because I maybe have not refined some certain edges and things like that like the nose looks quite flat and square at the minute because there's no information on it so it just looks like a, a triangle but as you start to build, break that triangle down into tone so this side of the nose is shaded and the top of the nose has actually got a, a bit of tone to it up until about that point which is where the tip is and this side is darker, so I'll do that bit again. And then there's a element to this. It's almost like a rectangle shape. Which is actually part of your nostril. Not the it's not the nostrils rectangular, but this is it's got the literal literal elements to describing things. People think you said my nose was rectangular. Um, I know that you wouldn't take it this way, but um, I was listening to I was listening to Noel Fielding, and he was when he was doing the Sky 
portrait artist of the week. Uh, he's a sitter, and he's saying he started a, a like a little art club up, a Saturday art club that he would do live, and he'd give demonstrations out to, or give ideas about what they're going to do next next week. And he is fun. He's kind of an exciting artist in the way he works. Um, though people know him for his comedy, he's actually some of his artworks really really good. Really like it. But he was saying to them that he has his art club, and he went, "Right, kids, this Saturday we're going to do this." And he said, and "On that Saturday, there was just children all over the the art class." And he was like, "Where have all the children? I mean, it's great. The children have all been there. They're all enjoying artwork, and that's great. And the parents are doing it too. But why, why, why is a lot of kids?" So he put the question out there, and he said, literally people came back and said, "Well, you said kids." And so he said, "Oh, like the British public can be very literal sometimes when they hear things." But he was just going like kids, you crazy cats, guys, and all the rest of it. Like how I would say, oh, all right, guys, how are you doing? I'm not expecting all you, all of you, to be men. It's just a generic term. If it offends anybody, let me know, and I can change the words. You know, that's that's how kind of communication works. Um, but he's just say, he just picked up on the fact that it was because he said, hey, kids, everybody thought, oh, you can only bring children. It's not for us. We're not allowed to do it. <laughs> So, yeah, crazy. Uh, so yeah, so when I say this the rectangular part of your nostril, I don't mean you have a rectangular part of your nostril. I mean I can see in this picture, on a on a subtle shading, there is a rectangular kind of shape. I'll use that as my descriptive tool to help me guide the shape and inform the, what's coming next. I can see where there's a darker area up here, which is obviously your nostril. I don't want to go too mad and cut it in as dark as it is because what will happen if if I've got it in the wrong place and I go to rub it out I've snookered myself because it'll leave a dark smudge and I don't want it to be that heavy just yet. I would like the drawings to kind of develop together so it kind of comes in and out of focus a little bit. I know I may sound like I repeat myself an awful lot but I found it um, especially in the classroom, it's very easy to forget some of the basics because I'm still doing it. I don't know if it means I'm just not very good at remembering stuff, but I'm finding myself constantly going, No, you need to slow down. What are you rushing for? Cause that constant communication of reiter reiterating some of the basics is kind of my process, I think, for myself. It might work for you, you might already get it and understand it straight away, um, which is great. But I've learned people learn in different ways. So even if we become very good at something, occasionally we can get a little bit blase. I've done it. You get a little blase with what you know, and you do actually forget some of the basics. And it's not until you start to make a few kind of structural errors in it that you start to go okay what's what's going wrong here oh yeah I'm just not doing some of the basics that I should be doing on a regular basis so you break it down and you find out what went wrong and you refine your practice if anybody's thinking oh what is that propelling pencil he's using I actually got this one from Tesco's shopping centre <laughs> because um, it was a pound so you can draw with anything they, you can buy leads online from different art suppliers uh, for propelling pencils you just need to make sure it's the same uh, diameter I think this one is a 0.5 millimeter so you can see how incredibly small and tiny the top is if I put my hand in front of that it should kind of focus in on it So you can see how fine the point is, um, but you can get sort of much smaller, finer ones and slightly thicker ones as well. So whenever you're buying the leads, it'll tell you the grade of the pencil and also the size of it as well. As long as you get the same size of pencil lead, it should fit any propelling pencil. It'll just slide through. You can get different versions. Hopefully that'll take you back into focus. Good. Um, you, know, you can get different versions of graphites and compounds that they use. So 
kind of you, you do need to kind of try a few out to see what best suit your style. So Stadler do them, Pentel do them. Um, I think nearly every pencil manufacturer that has a propelling pencil do a range of graphite pencil heads to go along with them. Um, and some work, to me, some work better than others. Um, but I'm not going to tell you which brands they are because I think it's subjective. It's what feels right for you. You might draw, like to draw on a particular surface where that particular brand of pencil lead really, really works. Um, I don't, don't know if you have... Do you all go into the art shops? Well, not, not at the minute, I know. Um, but I am like a kid in a sweetie shop when I'm in there because I'm always kind of going, I wonder what that does. How do you do this? What's that like? How? I'm very sort of inquisitive. Um, if you can, you can hone that kind of... Uh, inquisitive nature um, by you know allowing yourself to ask those questions that you probably stopped yourself from asking in adulthood you know be the, kids are brilliant at just asking you questions because they want to know the answer and there's no fear in it I think as we grow up we develop a kind of uh, hesitancy for asking questions because it shows our vulnerability and we have to be seen especially when we're at things like work that we are um, in control of absolutely everything so we are kind of seen as a solid person and therefore in kind of very concrete and that's that would be wonderful if you we were all like that but I think that's where some of the problems in a work environment can occur where if you're afraid of asking the questions you'll kind of patch things up around the thing because you don't know how to do it and that can long term lead into a problem or somebody else does the same thing that you've asked them to do and it can have like a knock on effect. I'm just going how do you do that? Great I've learned it, great now I can move on. I think um, so if we, we, I think we subconsciously get into that mould it's not to say it's true at, in a work environment that you can't ask the questions and be told the answer and learn something but you don't want to show a vulnerability and when it comes to learning things like art or doing the subject matter pure for pure enjoyment we're, we're still holding on to that uh, reluctance to ask how do you do that um, we always look for that one person in the class to ask all the questions <laughs> gonna sit back and go They'll ask. They'll, they'll ask a question. Go on. How do you, tell me, ask me how you do that. You always get people asking other people to ask you a question. <laughs> in a classroom. I don't know what. Don't know what that is. Oh, what? So, I'll, if, if anything, I'll kind of encourage you to develop your playful nature. Allow that to um, infuse your artwork. You know, you don't have to be perfect at everything. I'm not. You know, no, no, nobody is. So you're allowed to kind of develop what works for you, what doesn't work for you by making mistakes and asking questions if one thing came out of today's lesson was that, I would be a happy man I'm just looking at the some of the elements of the clothing as well. So I'm bopping backwards and forwards an awful lot and around and up and down the picture because I want to make sure I get the the form of everything right as well. I'm starting to refine where that line and that edge go so I can give weight and space to the portrait. Now I don't want to cram it in because I feel like it's not a prison cell. You know, I'm not putting everybody in like a little tiny square box. I want them to feel natural in their own little tiny space. Um, and how that works is by making sure you you don't crop things too tight. You can use cropping and compositional tools for different effects. I think we talked about this before in a previous one that. By changing how you place somebody in a space, you can in kind of subconsciously inform what they're like. So, if in a picture frame that was sort of square on, 
it had somebody sort of peeking out in a corner like that, you might say that they're kind of inquisitive or they're spying on you. Or you could infer a certain thing. Um, but I just want a basic likeness of everybody because the conceptuals of it is that uh, this is everybody together in COVID. I'm going to carry on drawing. I'm happy to carry on for a little bit if you're happy to watch. So, okay, uh, getting everybody into the space kind of do you like the bit of space above your head cut as I'm going to keep that um, might bring that in a little bit on this side and that's before I've drawn all, all the details but it just helps me kind of balance my view of what your portrait's doing and That's too wide. That's better. It goes that way. Yeah. I had this line coming down too low because it's coming below the angle of the shoulder, which is impossible. And that line is too angular, so I'm going to take that back out there. It then gives space to sort of this curve that's going to start to appear in in the top as it comes around. Creates a sp space and width there and as it comes around to this point it's a little bit of a darker line again this is darker than this so I'm just gonna lightly tone that just maybe a tone darker but again this is not a dark dark pencil but tonally, you can create a lot of balance with it. And then you can go back over with a high grip pencil and back, back over it and really develop the darknesses and really lighten the lights and go back over with, you know, your mono erasers or your pencil, um, your putty rubbers and things and play with textures. But basically, you need a, a kind of structure, uh, the architecture of the drawing in which to kind of attach everything to. If you make sure the architecture is right, everything will work. Um, I remember watching a, a documentary on uh, the guys who did all the computer generation and graphics for Shrek and they made a, somebody made a mistake on one of them and Shrek came out as this big fluffy ball but he was Shrek shaped so he still looked um, like Shrek even though there was no detail to him he was just this kind of fluffy ball moving around he moved like Shrek and he was shaped like Shrek but his texture was completely different that to me is interesting because we it's not necessarily the details that tell you what things are it's the forms and the forms and the shapes and the structure of it we can then apply different uh, techniques and approaches so we can have different genres of artwork to that so you could want to go into hyperrealism you could find that every little hair of a uh, of an eyelash and put those in that would be awesome if you wanted to go to that level um, if, if it's more gestural and you want to get a simplified image of that you might go into the impressionism side a representationalism side um, is so varied in the, what, what they want you to concentrate on visually um, if it's cubist you can then start to play with the structure and form and textures and put them around in different places and for different reasons to inform a certain thing you can play with colors that'll work really well you can play with the quality of line um quality of line is something that i haven't been really talking about much but um it's more to do with as you as you lay a mark down on a page it doesn't have to be the same line all over. Some lines could be very light and delicate, and then some th lines, lines are thick and heavy, and the thicker and heavy ones might inform um, a texture or a, a, a boundary, and the light and delicate one might show something soft and diffused. So it's how you can build up those qualities of all those different things. And there is no one answer to it. There's lots of different elements which you can add and subtract to suit your own tastes because it's your artwork you know there isn't um, just one way to do everything 
There is no one art book that will teach you to do everything. There is no one art tutor to teach you everything. You're you're the the person that can inform those choices. But if you do them with a certain awareness, you're in control of them. If they happen to you by accident, sometimes you can still be aware of them and use them. But if things are happening to you, you've got no idea what's happening, and it's just you do this, and you get a face, and you kind of like it, but you don't know why you like it, and you you don't know how you did it, and you don't know if you're going to do it again, or you, a bit of pressure because you've been asked to do it again, and you don't know if you can do it again. It, oh, you can get rid of that fear just by learning some of the basics first and kind of practice and try it out. And it's okay to fail and muck it up because <laughs> I do it and everybody does it. And then you try again. Just learn from it. Try again. Go through the same process of trying out, trying out. If you find yourself, um, here's a question I put out to you. Are you finding yourself when you're doing a drawing creating the same mistakes over and over and over and over again? Because they've, they're not too sure how to analyze what, they, what, were, what went wrong. Uh, or when they find out the answers to what went wrong, how to rectify it. Um, and I think if you get stuck, that's where you can use somebody like me, or you know, a tutor, or, or even if a good pair of eyes in, in who are around you, like a good friend or somebody in your household, that could um, be can give you good objective advice. Uh, when we're looking for feedback, um, I always tr say, look, if you're going to get feedback from anybody, just be ready for it. You know, if you're asking for feedback, you've got to accept it. You don't necessarily have to agree with it all. You know, somebody's point of view might be very specific about, or very focused on a particular thing, and that might not be your focus or a main area of artwork that you really concentrate about. You can still take it in. But put it through your own artistic filter. If people are just being mean, it's water for ducks back. It doesn't mean anything, and then you stop asking them. <laughs> you know, nobody should be just mean to you about your artwork at all, ever. Uh, if you are finding people are doing that, don't ask them. Don't show them. They're not worth it. They're not worth showing your artwork to. You might be saying they might not be. They might be worth being in your life for other reasons. But I mean, if you're asking for advice on your artwork and it's coming across a bit that's not helpful, don't ask. If you're getting advice from somebody and it's constructive and it's upsetting you, it may be their delivery on how they're passing it to you. It might not be what they're saying is wrong, but how they're actually informing you might might not be suiting you personally. You might hear the same thing said to you by somebody else to you in a slightly more pleasing manner, which makes you understand and go, yeah, I can accept that. Do you see what I mean? So when you're asking for advice, you know, ask it from a few people so you get a range of different f inputs. If you're completely lost and you need that kind of input, um, or talk to your peers who are also in the same boat as you, because they'll understand the learning process and they may have gone through the same process of issues that you're going through in your drawing. Or you can, if you build up a trust, you can ask the art, your art tutor as well ask me here if you feel comfortable enough um, I will always intentionally try and give constructive advice and try and be helpful if at any time I explain anything and it's upsetting to you let me know because I can take that on board and I can ad adapt the way I teach things to different people of different routes and this is more generic because it's uh, the internet <laughs> But if it's personal about your artwork and how you want to learn something, I can adapt and change it specifically more to you and tell the advice to you. Um, because I realise that everybody learns in different ways and at a different stages take on board information different, differently. I can remember back, as I said, I had a conversation with uh, one of my tutors in college and he was had a big long conversation about drawing a door handle and the quality of line on the door handle. He kept, he kept saying to me, so what is this? I'm pointing at this part of the door. I'm going, it's a door handle. He goes, yeah, but what is this? And this question went on for ages. And I was going, I don't know, it's a door. It's a door in a room. It's a door handle in a room. It's, <laughs> and he's going, no, 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 but what is it? What is it? And he, what he was trying to get at was it was a dark, the darkness, how one plane meets another plane, and the light, how one plane meets another plane creates an edge. And that edge appears to be a line, but it's not a line, it's a shadow. 
and the thinness of that shadow or depth or darkness of that shadow depends on the condition of the room and whatever. It was all of that. But he was wanting me to search out that aspect of my understanding and I didn't have it. It wasn't his failing as a teacher, it was just my lack of knowledge, but I think he was consistently going down the same route. I'd lost it, I'd got far away from the point he was trying to make, so I've learned that I adopt different approaches to different subject matters for different things and for different reasons. Sometimes that information can sound contradictory. I know it does, because as I, even as I say it, to teach, teach it sometimes, I know it sounds contradictory. And also when I've learned it, it sounded contradictory. But if you allow yourself to kind of go with the flow of it and trust it and see, trying it out, being at this is almost an like experimental stage where people think drawing, drawing things in realism, there's no experiment to it. It's very sort of copying. Um, there's actually quite a lot of experimentation in it and playfulness. We start to see the delicate nature between the one shape and another shape and the line and the flow and all of these things, which you then can expand upon. So I hope that makes sense. If I ever ramble, it does make sense. You need to kind of type and let me know. Uh, so yeah, this is follow Simeon's put coming on there. Um, <coughs> carry on drawing. So there's an awful lot of chat in our chat, and sometimes not enough drawing in the demo. I'm just going to darken this down a little wee tad because I think the de that line kind of comes down to about there and broadens out. I can use the shading on that line because the way it was quite angular it's diffused. Um, there's a line that comes down there, which is really subtle. You might not even see that on the page. You might even see that on the drawing. You might do. I'm not sure. Let me try and zoom in. A little bit more. It's going to get quite grainy for zooming any further. So I'm just looking about the quality of the drawing on there. Let's see. Hopefully that's okay. I'm going to kind of map in uh, the, you know, this for, it's the under, the bottom eyelid basically, the shadow on the bottom eyelid, which comes straight across. Um, what's interesting is, it follows follows the the gesture of the head, because the, the head is angled, you naturally assume that the glasses follow the shape, and it doesn't, because the glasses are sat off the face or on the face, they don't follow the this, this, this same um, axis of the eyes because the eyes are going around and the glasses are generally straight. Do you see what I mean? So you think about your head. I can draw it. Um, let's zoom out a bit. Spin this around. Just do a quick demo here. I'll draw this slightly because I need to use this space. If your head is round like that, as a cross section, so if that's the back of your head coming up the top part of your skull, kind of coming down to where your eyes are, and then your nose, and then lips, mouth, chin comes up that way. Can you see that okay? No, maybe not. <laughs> I don't want to draw it too dark because it's on the drawing surface, but uh, there should sometimes the camera picks up my pencil rather than the paper. So if we took the top of somebody's head off, it sounds horrific, but it creates this cross cross section. If we were to draw the glasses on somebody's face, so this is the nose that sits out here, and they would sit straight like that. The eyes, however, are sat back in the head and go around the curve shaped part of the head. So when you're looking at something, you can assume that the eyes are in the middle of the glasses, but the glasses are actually straight. 
they straight across that, that way. And the eyes are curved around. And because you've got them at, a, at an angle, they'll appear that the angle of the eyes changes as, as opposed to the angle of the glasses. It's not that they're sitting like that. <laughs> it's that the glasses are straight and we're looking up from an angle and the glasses, the eyes actually themselves are almost horizontal. So if you did a horizontal line there, even just putting that horizontal line, line in, you can see how they don't follow the angle of the glasses. I zoom out because I've just drawn that in. <laughs> I realised I hadn't changed that here. So, almost did like an air, like a little beep or a siren to go. No, you've gone off focus. <laughs> You're not on the screen. That's where you get producers and things like the big setups on YouTube. Have guys kind of sat outside doing the chat. I've got guys doing the lighting, camera work. Um, it's a whole big kind of production thing. Um, but you almost like, I don't know, need an app to go, uh, that's out of focus. <laughs> Me, I can change it back in. So, yeah, what I was saying there was the uh, the eyes from the reference are almost, they're slightly angled, not much, slightly angled. Um, they don't quite follow the axis of the glasses because of that. So if you visually check something, see that eye in that space on that head in at that particular time from that particular angle you're just looking at the image break that down you it takes a little bit of practice to disengage with what you think you know you kind of have to leave out assumptions and literally just draw what we've heard that an awful lot draw what you see but then people go well, what is that I, I'm, I, I don't know how to draw what I see and that's the problem it's a case of if you trust your eye to your hand and it sounds weird but disengage your brain because your brain will try to infuse certain things you need to set a certain clarity and awareness that's why occasionally you take a break from a drawing you see it afresh and you can come back and go oh that needs to move and you can just make a quick adjustment and it, it pushes you further on in the picture um, there's lots of merit about watching people do a drawing from start to finish all the way through I've learned a lot through watching videos like that, but I think to put that pr much pressure on yourself starting out is a lot of pressure because these guys are like professional artists who do a sitting and do a drawing and have it finished. You go, wow, it's amazing. That's a lot of practice which you're not seeing behind that behind the lines and a lot of focus. Um, you're developing your skills, so you're developing your focus, you're developing your vision, you're developing your drawing skills developing how you see and how you look and things so do take that into account so you're learning an awful lot so stop pressurizing yourself when you're not quite achieving everything in one picture and not to not achieving it fast enough speed will come and that with with practice but it's not about speed it's about your artwork first and foremost I hope that makes sense um, how did this work for you today did you enjoy YouTube I was thinking, look, I still might do uh, a YouTube stream, continue it going. It may be a case of that I do both Facebook and YouTube, and I'll carry on doing Twitch as well. Um, because I just find it kind of a pleasurable experience drawing and communicating at the same time. It's becoming like a, a nice habit to have, and a functional, productive habit, habit because I'm making more artwork. Um, but yeah, I'll sort of continue this on. Uh, I might continue on through the week and then we'll start a new portrait next week. Um, let me know what you think. If there's anything specifically you want me to cover, you can let me know. There's a discussion section in the on the page if you can jot down what you think on your answers and stuff. Because uh, I will review it, I get notifications from that. Uh, if you want to follow up what's happening, you can press subscribe and we, uh, you'll get notifications of more videos like this, more content. and. Yeah, we can develop it that way. If there's any links to any products that I use, like rubbers and pencils and bits and pieces like that, I'll put a link up to them. It's not to say that you have to use 
those links you can go off and obviously shop elsewhere and I kind of encourage people if you've got a local art shop in the areas to uh, see if you can buy from them wherever you are to support a local business sometimes those lo local businesses also have shops on Amazon so it can give you a lot of information regarding uh, the products and things and can let you shop around that way but it's more of an information device uh, some of the things I use I don't know where you are based in the world you might not be able to get hold of them look in your location uh, so the next best thing would be something like Amazon um, so that's the reason why I use it but I just want to be totally clear and upfront the way it works is I put a link up and I get a small percentage back from a sale now you don't pay anything extra you pay exactly the same if you've found it by yourself it's just like a, a, an affiliate scheme but I also wanted to be uh, clear with that one uh, I think well, after another slip of coffee we'll give a couple of minutes if everybody wants to answer any questions or anything um, but we'll call it a day for today Again, apologies for the beginning. It was my fault. <laughs> it was uh, YouTube functions fine if you know how to use it. Because it's just me now to do it. So if I can make mistakes, yeah, everybody else can. As I say, when I've been watching these live broadcasts, um, nearly everybody talks about some sort of technical issue, whether it be the broadband speed rate drops out, or it gets very sticky, or the, the image from the computer is not great, or, you know, uh, camera switches off, which happens an awful lot. <laughs> Again, I'll try and figure out a um, more pleasing way not to get around all these kind of issues and stuff. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again for joining, and I'll see you again soon. See you next Saturday for definite. 11 o'clock here on YouTube. <laughs> you don't think you'll be able to watch it over on Facebook as well at the same time. Guys, take care. Been good fun. Thanks very much. Angela, see you next week. Take care. Ciao. Bye.